Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Teilnehmende, wir sind schon wieder zurück im nächsten Raum mit unserer nächsten Keynote-Speakerin. Noch ein paar Details zu ihrer Person. Ihr Name weist sprichwörtlich den Weg in die Zukunft und ihre Arbeit zeugt von jahrzehntelanger interdisziplinärer und auch transkontinentaler Zusammenarbeit. Sie ist Geschäftsführerin des SUNY Center for Collaborative Online International Learning, das Fakultätsmitglieder und StudentInnen mit Gleichgesinnten auf der ganzen Welt für projektbasierte Online-Kooperationen verbindet. Zuvor war sie Geschäftsführerin des Open Education Consortium, das sich der Entwicklung offener Bildung und deren Auswirkungen auf die Hochschulbildung ähm, auf der ganzen Welt widmet. Sie war Dekanin für Afrikanistik, für das SIT-Studium im Ausland und arbeitete fast zwei Jahrzehnte lang mit afrikanischen Institutionen zusammen. Während dieser Zeit baute sie Technologie und Fernunterricht in das internationale Bildungsprogramm ein und entwickelte Möglichkeiten zur Zusammenarbeit über Ländergrenzen hinweg sowie zwischen verschiedenen Studenten und Fakultätsgruppen, also wirklich ein interdisziplinärer Anspruch. Sie war Fakultätsmitglied im Fachbereich Afrikanistik mit den Schwerpunkten Umweltforschung und Nachhaltigkeit. Der Titel ihrer Keynote lautet The Future of Education is Connected. A very warm welcome, please, to Mary Lou Forward. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here with you and very excited for all of the very interesting presentations that are here at the festival. So we have about a half an hour. I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for discussion at the end. So I'm going to go through some of the thinking that I put into why I believe the future of education is connected. And I want to start by setting the stage to give us some context. Um, so in 2012, there was a survey conducted by the Pew Research Center here in the United States with just over a thousand professors and administrators in higher education and some organizations who work exclusively with higher education to to imagine what the future of higher education would be. Now, if we remember 2012, this was the year of the MOOC that um, predicted widespread disruption for higher education. Things like there would be only 10 universities in the world, or there would be a handful of mega universities and most of the smaller institutions would close. So this was a year when talk of disruption in higher education was everywhere. Um, as part of this survey, people were presented with two scenarios of what higher education could look like in 2020, and they were asked to pick the scenario they agreed with. You can see here that scenario one predicted that much would be the same in terms of educational delivery in higher education, that it would still be reliant on in-person and on-campus attendance with primarily lecture style of delivery. Almost 40%, 39% of people agreed with scenario one that this is the way it would be in 2020. In scenario two, this predicted big changes to educational delivery, including distance learning, video conferencing, and hybrid classes, with much less time spent in in-person classes. It's also worth noting that this scenario in particular predicted significant pedagogical shifts towards individualized learning and, average, and leveraging of expert resources from, from a distance, which presumably included uh, professors and practitioners from around the world. 60% of respondents agreed with this major change to higher education. So now here we are in 2020, and we know that both of those scenarios are significantly correct, that both of them have taken place this year alone. However, the disruption was not from Uh, other forms of educational delivery as was predicted in the year of the MOOC, but obviously from major shifts happening in public health. So the long-term staying power of these shifts remains to be seen and, and is up to us to figure out. I wanted to dive into a couple of quotes that were associated uh, with that study as well. And you can see this quote here, this person is envisioning that technology allows for that pedagogical shift that we saw in, in scenario two, more opportunities to connect and more enhanced learning opportunities. And here's another quote. What 
What strikes me about these two quotes is that we are pretty much talking about the same thing now. So it's interesting to note that this was a time when great disruption was uh, was predicted, but didn't happen. And now we're in a period where great disruption was not predicted and has happened, and we're still visiting the same themes. This is another quote from uh, Kathy Davidson, who's the director of the Futures Initiative at the CUNY Graduate Center. And what she encourages us to do is to think about the way that we learn. Think about when you want to learn something new. So gardening, for example, or maybe how to play a musical instrument. What do you do when you want to, to, to learn these things? You typically consult expert sources. That might be a teacher or a mentor, might be friends. It could be books or articles. It could be YouTube. And you want to apply what you learn, give it a try, analyze what, what went well, what didn't work. And based on that analysis, find more expert uh, advice and guidance and try it again. So we know that this cycle of learning is basically what Mary Starry was saying before. We know what works. We've known what works forever. We've known since the 40s that internships and practicums are very beneficial to students who are studying uh, in higher education. And yet these are still treated as anomalies. They're still treated as innovations. Uh, 60 years out, we have yet to bring that fully into, uh, into the to the way that we practice higher education. And our educational systems often make it very difficult for us to bring these kinds of authentic learning experiences to our students. So what does that mean? Now what? What do we do with all of this? I want to consider current events uh, in, a, in a couple of very specific ways to think about what we do with these things. And the first is the push for social justice. This is another disruption that wasn't necessarily foreseen for this year, but these movements are raising awareness of institutionalized and structural inequalities. In the United States, this is primarily focused on structural racism, but the immediate impact of what we're seeing in higher education is the amplification of professor concern for student learning and equity. These movements are having an impact in the way we think about teaching, the way we think about who we're teaching and how we're teaching. Professors are seeking and implementing inclusive teaching strategies, and both professors and students have heightened awareness of institutionalized inequalities that exist within and outside of higher education. And of course, the pandemic and the concern for public health has pushed major shifts in educational delivery, as we talked about earlier. So I know that this uh, survey here is based exclusively on US data, but I hope that it mirrors some of what's happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, in, this, in the Pew study that we looked at earlier, 60% of respondents believed that scenario two, that is, online and hybrid delivery would be the standard in higher education. And what we actually see from this data of just last week is that is the fact in the United States that 65% of US institutions that responded to the survey, which is about three quarters of, of higher ed institutions in the States, are hybrid mostly or fully online. So uh, another, th another study that came out in response to the shift to online is top priorities, <clears throat> excuse me, in planning for the fall term. This study was just released last week and you can see from the top that 71% of professors surveyed said that their biggest priority is to increase student engagement. So the bad news is that professors think their students are largely unengaged in their learning, but the good news is that professors want students to be engaged. So you can see the top bar in green were responses that were given in August and the bottom bars uh, were responses that were given in May. So you can see the change in percentage uh, is about, it's a little less than 20% who are more concerned with student engagement. <clears throat> and this could be due to the effect of some of these social justice movements and how that is pushing professors to be more concerned with their students and how they are learning, or it could be due, due to the awareness of uh, inclusive, te inclusive teaching practices, um, but it's probably some of each. Uh, they're probably feeling more comfortable with online and can now turn to pedagogy, and they're probably also aware of the social issues that are happening and trying to incorporate that in their teaching. But the bottom line, the result is that professors are 
focusing more on students and their motivations to learn. So what does that mean for higher education? On the one hand, institutions have been forced to focus on delivery. They're ensuring students have devices and connectivity to be able to take advantage of the online learning that's happening now. They're testing and they're sanitizing their campuses for in-person learning. And this is important and it's necessary uh, for the business of education. But now, as we've just seen, professors are starting to shift from the provision of education to the vision of education. And as we're thinking about the vision of education, we really need to bear in mind that education is an essential tool that societies use to build their future. So we need to collectively ask, what kind of future do we want? And our educational vision needs to focus on that. So this is how I've come to this. The future of education is connected. And when I say this, I mean it's connected in many different senses of this word. That connection socially means that people collaborate, that they get in touch, that they understand, that they communicate. Connection of ideas, the interdisciplinarity of education is really important. It's important to help students understand why learning this helps them with that. Uh, and also technology connected over technology. This is a really important means that's not going away for people to be connected. And of course, the application of knowledge. How do you connect the practice and the experience with the theory and, and the reflection that's necessary to learn? So I wanna focus uh, specifically on international and intercultural connections as an illustration of what we mean by these, this type of connect, connectivity, um, since this is primarily the work that I do. So we know that it's really easy to critique and that it's much, much harder to build. We also know that tools that we need to build are already infused in higher education in many ways. At this festival that we're attending today, we see many people presenting really interesting tools that are out there. What we need to do is to bring them forward and to connect these tools to make a new web of, uh, support for the kind of education we want to deliver. Um, let me introduce you quickly to the tool that we use. You've been seeing this SUNY COIL logo in the corner of the slides. Um, and so what that means is it's collaborative online international learning. The model for that, oh, sorry, let me first go to the vision. So the vision that the COIL Center created a little over a year ago is basically that we believe the future of education is internationally and interculturally connected. And how we do this, this is a way to connect professors and students across differences in culture, location, and languages by embedding collaborative projects into existing classes. The professors connect to plan and design COIL collaborations, and the students connect to discuss and to carry out the projects that the professors design. Because it's embedded as part of the class, it provides opportunities for every student to have a significant international and intercultural experience. So it's both access and equity. And because it's embedded as part of a class, professors can design collaborations to meet the needs of their students and their courses. And because it's part of a class, it makes international collaboration possible throughout a student's educational experience, meaning that they can learn, analyze, practice, and apply multiple times during their higher education career. It's not a one-off situation. It's not, here's your international experience, wasn't that great, now come back and do what you need to do locally, but rather this is a way to infuse the importance of intercultural understanding throughout a student's experience. I wanna give a few examples because I think this lends texture to what we're talking about and also shows how it works within disciplines and also in an interdisciplinary way. So here's an example from a uh, a project that's actually been going on for several years between the United States and Lebanon, a class on business management in the US and a class on entrepreneurship in Lebanon. And the students focus on cultural influences on management style. This is a project that they do as part of their class. So the teaching is still happening as it normally would in both classes. And then 
uh, for about six weeks in the middle of the term, the students take on this project where they interview people who are working in businesses in their local communities. They exchange that information. They discuss it. They talk about why people approach this way, things in this way or in another way and what inf how it relates to their culture, what influences um, dictate management style in each country. Here's another example between the US and Brazil, journalism and sociology. Professors planned a project to have students examine the coverage of controversies in the press. They look at current events. They look at different journalistic traditions in each country. They look at the influence of uh, socioeconomic factors, perhaps political um, leanings of different kinds of press coverage. And they compare how coverage is or how controversies are covered in the press and what that means from a cultural perspective. Another example that I think is particularly interesting is a class in broadcasting in South Africa combined with a gender studies class in Mexico. The professors got together and said to the students, you need to do something that combines these two areas of study. And they gave their students actually fairly wide uh, ability to plan this. And what students came up with was they developed a public service announcement on gender-based violence, one that was appropriate to Mexico in Spanish, one that was appropriate to South Africa in English. And you can see in all of these examples that students have agency. They make choices, they design, they collaborate with their peers and classes in other countries. They often choose the means they're going to collaborate. The, the official connection might happen within a university's LMS or perhaps in a third party thing like Google Classroom, but students get to choose how they communicate. They communicate on WhatsApp. Sometimes they use other types of social media. Professors support students and guide their reflection and analysis, both of the content and of the intercultural understanding. And this is really key. So I wanted to show the underlying pedagogy of COIL and what we try to do. It has distinct phases that support intercultural group formation. It supports learning and practicing skills that we saw earlier, and it supports project-based learning. So this model encourages ongoing and meaningful student connections. Apart from designing and planning the collaboration, the professors provide essential functions, such as helping students reflect, analyze, question and apply their learning at each stage. And the reflection really can't be understated. It's very important to help students think about what it is they're learning and how they're going to make ad um, adaptations to be able to move forward. So as a tool, I wanted to look at COIL in light of the needs that we looked at at the beginning of this talk. Uh, looking again at this particular quote that expressed the vision for technology to enhance learning experience and connections with others, that we really need to let pedagogy fuel passion and to create authentic learning opportunities for students uh, with a focus on student learning. And we need to do this in a way that's acceptable and allowable in our current higher education structure. Um, but what about social justice? How, how does international and intercultural connections help us make progress towards racial equity and reduced inequalities in general? We know that a significant outcome of international and intercultural experiences is a better understanding of who one is and their own culture. The question is, does this, is this true? Does this apply when you're having these experiences in a virtual environment versus a face-to-face -face environment. And what we're finding is, yes, if it's designed and done well, which means if it follows the pedagogy, there is reflection built in, you're allowing students to have agency, then yes, students step forward and they take a lot out of this program. We're, this slide is from a student presentation on what they learned during an internationally connected program that was focused on the US, UN Sustainable Development Goals. This one was focused on number 10, reduced inequalities. And you can see that what they've done is they've extrapolated learning uh, at a very high level that they can apply to their own communities and their own culture and their own lives. So the key is not how the experience is delivered, it's how the experience is analyzed, understood, and applied. So it's not about the provision of education, it's about the vision of education. And if we lead with that, we will have great results. So 
I want to end on this so we can have a discussion. Um, we know this is true. We know that we're in a period of great disruption in higher education, and we know we've got the tools to make education better and more connected. What we really do with this is up to us. So we will need to ask ourselves, how will we build the future of education to serve the building of future societies? So I'd love to uh, to have to take questions or to um, to engage in a discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a delight listening to you and learning from your experiences in Mary Lou Forward. Um, I believe that uh, there has been one, if not several key sentences, but one really struck my nerve. Students have agency. Thanks for just spelling that out again. This is so important to focus on. Like um, They should be at the center of our thoughts. So we do have two questions up to this point, or maybe even three. I will just start with the first one by Sylvia File. Can you share some ideas for icebreakers, please? Oh, absolutely. So uh, it one of the things that we do as we're supporting professors to create these kinds of collaborations um, is to, to talk about the importance of team building. And this is also really important when you're looking at different cultural traditions. So some cultures are very task oriented and others are much more relationship oriented. So some, some of that answer depends on who you're collaborating with. If you're collaborating with two very task oriented cultures, the icebreakers can be a little bit uh, shorter and more superficial. If you're collaborating between a task based culture and a relationship based culture, you need to really think about and repeat these icebreakers and these team building activities. So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of what uh, of what professors have used that are very effective. One is um, kind of a day in the life. So we ask students uh, to use smartphones to take a quick video of what their daily life might be and do it in two minutes and exchange that with a small group of students on the other side and engage in conversations about what this means, uh, how this reflects general culture, how this might reflect subcultures, etc. Another one that works really well, and I'll give a particular example on this because um, it kind of had amazing results. We had a community college, the SUNY system includes 64 institutions across New York State, and that's everything from community and technical colleges to professional schools like medical schools. Um, and so within the community college, one of the students uh, was a returned soldier from the Middle East, from the war in the Middle East. And she went up to the professor and said, um, the professor had, had created a collaboration with uh, a school in, in Lebanon. And she said to the professor, I don't want to do this because I've been there and I know these people and I don't, I don't want to interact with them. And the professor said, just try, try for a week. And if you really don't like it, we will come up with an alternate assignment. And the icebreaker she put out was to talk about what you do in your free time. And this uh, student found another student in Lebanon who was a volunteer firefighter, and so was she. And they created a relationship that's still going on. It's now been three or four years since this happened. Um, that's that that they really bonded over the fact that in their free time they were firefighters, and so you were a, they were able through this icebreaker to see the humanity that they were unable to see from their previous experiences. But it's one beautiful example. Thank you for sharing this with us. I will go straight to the next question. That is by Martina Emke. Do you have any information on how the intercultural collaborations have impacted on lecturers' professional skills, including their intercultural skills? That's a great question. So we are actually, um, the field of virtual exchange, which is where we operate, is a relatively young field and we are just starting to do some of that research and analysis. Uh, what we have now are more, are mainly anecdotal. And so, you know, we have professors who tell us that it's improved their teaching and learning because they're able to adopt strategies that their partner professors are using in other countries, um, that they have been able to make connections for research and for um, other other types of collaborative work that they want to do by doing this because you don't necessarily have to have a partner identified in, in the beginning. There are ways to locate teaching partners um, through 
our, our all kinds of networks that exist right now actually in virtual exchange. So if you were interested, for example, in learning more about Brazil, you might seek out a partner in Brazil and then you could create a longer term uh, collaboration with that. It also allows them to see this idea of interdisciplinary studies and how they can bring this into their classroom to again, really enhance the learning and to make those connections for students between the ideas that they're learning in their discipline and how it might apply to a different discipline. So the short answer is there are some studies out there and I can certainly uh, share that with the uh, festival organizers if people are interested, um, but there's uh, it's a small body of research right now and we're working on uh, expanding that. Thank you. Straight up to the next question by someone anonymous. I was wondering how you work with faculty who are still hesitant to engage in COIL activities. How do you convince lecturers to start with COIL? Yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's also a very good question. So uh, if people are hesitant but curious, then it's a relatively easy thing to do. We can give you a template for COIL experiences that have happened in the past um, that you can use to, to build your collaboration with someone else. And that way you've got kind of a foundation of a tried and true methodology um, if you don't want to go through and, and design your own right from the very beginning. Uh, the other answer to that is if someone is truly hesitant, it might not work, right? So we all know that change is um, change is hard. And if someone is resistant to change, you don't necessarily want to be pushing them into it right at the beginning because uh, they need to have the confidence. They need to be able to see that it's worked for other people. They need to be able to see the benefits for themselves. And you want them invested. As I mentioned before, the role of the faculty members are critical in helping students make these connections and helping them analyze and and understand what it is they're learning to be able to apply it to their future educational and life choices. And if a professor isn't ready for that, then it could really backfire for everyone. So I would say that um, we try to work with those who are uh, excited about this idea right now. And as, as with all kinds of change, when there is more of a critical mass, when there's more research, when there's more um, opportunity to connect with people who are doing this as educational practice, it's easier than to bring on those who are a little more hesitant. That leaves us with one minute and 40 seconds for the very last question. We will make this really quick, but it's a very interesting question, I guess. Um, by Uwe Schulze, he's asking, by means of being globally connected, do you think we should start to talk and think about the internet in terms of a edu web, mm -hmm. in contrast to web 1.0, 2.0, geo web, etc.? That's a really interesting question. I think that um, you know we often talk about lenses that there are lenses on on educational content, that there are lenses on any content that you can bring into education. Um, I think the idea of an edu web, which is more of a lens on the web uh, that supports education is is fascinating. I think that's a really interesting way to consider it. Certainly we know that not all content out there is necessarily what we would want to include in uh, in education, but there is, there is the opportunity to even look at that material and analyze it and apply it in different ways and to understand it from, um, you know, the, the direction of different societies that create that. So um, I love that idea and I'd be really interested to see uh, if that's something that you're working on.